survey. There's a good point in there that the time uh, between uh, document and uh, peer feedback uh, meant that you were giving peer feedback often too late to be useful, so the deadlines have been rearranged a little bit. Um, quizzes moved later, peer feedback moved earlier, so just check the calendar for that. Uh, any questions to, to get us started? Uh, there will be a uh, document with information about the final project and suggestions for potential topics. Uh, I think that will be available this week, but beginning of next week is the latest. Um, then in a few weeks, the final project proposal uh, will be due. Um, so, we were talking about virtual memory and different strategies for organizing virtual memory, different strategies for translating a virtual address uh, to a physical address uh, before break. So I'd like to kind of get our heads back into what's going on there with a couple uh, review exercises. So you will uh, hopefully recall uh, that we uh, talked about segmentation as a strategy, and we had a segment table uh, that had uh, entries for different uh, different segments of our virtual memory, uh, and that. Things in this table were kind of the, the start of a segment, the end of the segment, uh, and whether the segment could be read or written or executed, that sort of thing. And so it's imagine we have. Back in a heap uh, as two of our segments. I'd like you to think about what uh, would what would allow us to distinguish uh, if we can between uh, like we don't have these labels. Uh, how could we at least tell the difference between uh, an entry for a stack and an entry for a heap? All thinking B. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, of these four reasons anyway. That's how our stack and heap uh, would appear different in in the segment table. Oh. Also, also, is it C kind of true? Because like, I give you two segments that you don't know which one stack is in. I'll ask you which one stack is in. If you don't know who it is, uh, I would almost agree uh, that we don't. Uh, uh, so if the base and bounds are, say, physical addresses, yeah. which when we were using the segment table for address translation, they were, uh, I would say yes. We just based on those, we don't know which is the stack and which is the heap. Um, part of the reason that I ask this question is because it is relevant to Lab Four. If you uh, and if we have a virtual address and OSV is going to keep track of different regions of, of memory with the kind of start and the end in virtual address space of these regions, we can tell like which region a particular address is in using this sort of information. 
and if we're in virtual address, uh, at least on x86, the stack will be at higher virtual addresses than the heap. So that would be one way to, to distinguish them. You might also, as we'll see, keep <coughs> maybe an explicit label for one or more of these of these segments. Other questions on? <coughs> All right, at the end of last time, uh, we, we had talked about, talked about segments and to talk about some pros and cons of segments. Uh, they had some, uh, some definite benefits over the kind of regular base and bound, uh, but there were some significant downsides. Anyone remember what a downside was? I think they're much harder to maintain. They're just more complicated. Yeah, the, the memory management became more complex. Uh, why was it more complex? There. <clears throat> For resizing and those sorts of things. So you have to create a, a whole other block uh, in another space. Yeah, it had to do with the size. Segments, are they fixed size or variable size? Yeah, segments can be all different sizes. And if you think back to implementing malloc in 208, that was an instance where you were dealing with managing chunks of memory of variable size. And there was all sorts of uh, work or infrastructure you needed to keep track of like finding a uh, available chunk of space that was big enough for the allocation you needed to do, keeping track of what was what was allocated and free, a lot of work involved. And at the end of last time, started talking about an idea of fixed size. And remember what that was called? David? Yes, we talked about, okay, instead of Dividing memory up into these variable size segments, we're going to divide it up into these fixed size units called pages. And so today, we're going to go through the kind of mechanics of how do we actually kind of implement this paging approach to uh, to address translation as opposed to our our segment approach. Uh, but I want to start with kind of the big picture of thinking about why would this fixed size be an improvement over our variable size segments? So you kind of know, know why, why we're talking about this at all. So I'd like you to take a look at this and think about what problem with our variable size segments does dividing memory into fixed size chunks solve? All right, most people thinking D, I would agree. Uh, someone explain your thinking behind A. Why would our fixed size uh, avoid this external fragmentation? Uh, there's literally no space between allocated chunks because they're all right next to each other. Each page is just, as soon as one page ends, the next one begins. And so if you've allocated a page, there's everything else is unallocated and free. Yeah, and there is never a chunk that is not a multiple of the size of a page. So kind of, no matter how we divide it up, if there's available space, it's at least one page in size. And we can always allocate it. Uh, how about C? Makes it easy to find free memory. Elliot. Uh, I think we talked about it on Friday, where you could just set like a list of zeros and ones where a one is like as free as zeros and allocated or you know, one or whatever. That's very dense. Exactly. That we, one, we have kind of an efficient way to, to mark all of our identical chunks uh, allocated or free, and literally any available page will do. That we can just, whatever one we find, it is the right size for allocating a page. Uh, how about B? Why? 
Uh, why is B not something that, that our fixed size uh, is going to help us with? Vicente? Um, because this approach actually induces a lot of internal fragmentation. Exactly. That our variable size could be exactly the size that we need, and we won't have any uh, necessarily. We can avoid all internal fragmentation. Whereas when we move to fixed size, now even if we need one byte, we're going to need to pay an entire page to put it in. Common page size on real systems would be four kilobytes. So if we have a uh, a four byte integer, you know, that's a, a, uh, about a, a, sa a thousand of uh, a single page. So we could uh, we could end up with a, a ton of internal fragmentation kind of in, in the worst case scenario. Uh, questions on this? Does all this make sense? All right, let's talk about how this paging is actually going to work. And uh, in fact, the picture for our paging is going to look quite similar to our picture of how address translation with segments work, where uh, we have our CPU, it wants to fetch some particular piece of data. Uh, what kind of address does the CPU use? Physical or virtual? Yeah, so our CPU wants to fetch something. This is a virtual address. And uh, does anyone remember what we did with our virtual address uh, to use a segment table? There was physical address plus a bound or a base. Yeah, we took some part of our virtual address and put it together with the base to get the physical address. Uh, and that required kind of dividing up our virtual address into two pieces. For segments, it was we had some piece that was an index into our segment table, like which segment does this virtual address go with, and then the rest was uh, kind of offset within that segment. And similarly with our pages, we're going to have a page number, or as it's commonly written, a virtual page number. Uh, not a private network, but a page number. And we have the same idea of an offset kind of within the page. So some part of our virtual address identifies which virtual page is this, and the other part is, okay, where within this, say, four kilobytes of memory in the page, where is the actual address we're looking for? And as you might expect, instead of a segment table, we have a page table with a number of entries in it. Creatively, each entry in our page table is called a page table entry for PTE, and uh, if you look at the reading, it talks about uh, the information that's in uh, kind of an x86 page table entry, kind of 32 bits, has a bunch of, and, and if you're curious kind of of those nitty gritty details, take a look at the reading. Um, not fall asleep. Uh, but for our purposes, Right now, we're just going to focus on uh, two, two parts to each page table entry. A a frame number, or so there's kind of 
different terminology that all means the same thing. Uh, a frame by like a physical frame, physical page, these are the same idea. These are our fixed size chunk. And this is actually a frame of number, which Call a, a, a frame number or a physical page number so that kind of goes with our, our virtual page number, identifies kind of which chunk of memory, which virtual page, physical page number, which four kilobyte chunk of physical memory. Uh, and our VPN is just used as an index into our basically array of page table entries. That our virtual page number says, okay, which of these pages, and our page table right now has one of these page table entries for each virtual page. Which one of these entries does this virtual page correspond to? And when we get there, we can kind of take our frame and take our offset. And I'll write this in the other way. We're going to take our frame number or our physical page number. And if we take the frame number and concatenate it with our offset, those two things together give us the full physical address. And so you can think of the, this frame number, this physical page number, as an index into our physical memory. This is just a big array of our, of our page size chunks. And so our frame number is going to get us to some spot in that. And then within that four kilobyte chunk, the offset will tell us which specific byte we're looking for. Does this make sense so far? Any questions? All right, so anyone uh, have any idea what this access is about, David? Whether it's open or not, like, can we actually go in there? Uh, yeah, so can you say more what you mean by that? Like, if some process has opened the page and, like, has ownership of it. Yeah, so uh, I guess that, that brings up a good point. Since each process has its own virtual address space, each process thinks, oh, I have virtual address from 0 to hex f, 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 f. Uh, that means each process kind of has its own complete set of uh, virtual pages that it could conceivably try to access, which means that each process needs, each virtual address space needs a separate page table. That each one of these needs to translate that process's virtual addresses, which may be the same across many different processes, to different kind of physical pages. So uh, we will want to know, uh, for example, is the physical, is there actually a physical page in memory? Because it's not guaranteed that this virtual page actually has a matching physical page. Uh, and that's usually done with a something like a valid bit, just a one or a zero to say kind of this entry in the page table is it actually pointing us to a real physical page. Because without that, we have no way to tell from just our physical page number whether that's a valid entry or not. Because this, this is in memory somewhere. There are bytes there, and we want, need to be able to know, should we actually read these bytes to do the address translation, or is this not 
Is there not a physical page on the other end? So this is valid bit, which I have not put in this picture. What else might this answer to? Read, write, or execute? Yes. So just like for segments, we said, OK, this segment, you can read and write. This segment is read only, uh, et cetera. Now for each page, we're going to keep track of what permissions the process has in relation to this page. Can they read it? Can they write it? Can they execute instructions down there? That makes sense? Are there questions at this point? All right. So in any of the cases where We do this. Uh, we, we do this lookup in the page table, and uh, the page is not valid, meaning that there is no physical page. Or say I'm trying to write to a read-only page. So if we have a non-valid PT or we have a bad access, meaning we're trying to do something in this page that we're not allowed to do, though there, say, is a physical page, we're just not allowed to, to write to it or whatever, this triggers a processor exception called a page fault. And when we have uh, some sort of processor exception, uh, anyone remember, how does the kernel respond to this? In a kind of general way, what happens when we have some sort of exception? Uh, it goes to, right, it goes to like the hard place. Yeah, we go to this kind of preloaded table that, that, that we've set up in Clever into the hardware, and we we'll use that to look up something. What is that something? On? Yeah, we need to look up what function do we call when this specific like weirdness happens. And so we have a page fault. That's going to result in running our page fault handler. Some function inside the kernel that's been uh, implemented to kind of deal with the fallout from a page fault, from some sort of invalid memory access. And there are different ways it can be invalid. There you go. Do you save all the memory similar to how we, we, we like save the fault of the registers for the interrupt handler? Yes, this mechanism is the kind of same kind of exception or, or interrupt that we talked about earlier. We need to, a user process has made some, uh, some bad access. We need to save that state and transfer control of this kernel and run this handler. Um, so, what uh, if if uh, a process has, has made a bad access? Uh, is that something that uh, we should be able to recover from, or do we need to terminate the process? No. How do we recover since we haven't actually tried to get that data or do anything with it? So what would it mean to recover from uh, a bad access? So program has tried to, to, to write to some memory that it's not allowed to write to. Go on. I think it should be like, sometimes the kernel also does not, but if you do like the copy and write thing, then if they try to write something they don't have access to, that's fine because you just want to copy it. And then they have access to that new one. Like if it's something where like you didn't get map this yet, then it's fine. Or if you're like access the page that hasn't been loaded in yet, that's probably fine. Probably just want to load in the page and not just kill it. Yeah, so this is a good point. There are different circumstances where this bad access, like our copy on write, we've specifically marked things as read only in kind of a temporary way. So that we only do this copy when we need to. 
And so in that case, a bad access, we should do the copy and then uh, kind of turn control back over to the user process. And the way this page fault handler will actually work uh, is we will return such that we repeat whatever instruction caused the page fault handler. Because if it was a memory access and then we you know, made a copy and now they can write to it, we want to retry that same memory access because now it should work. Whereas other kinds of interrupts, we might uh, return to the kind of the next instruction after. A page fault, we need to it will uh, the uh, mechanics will kind of restart uh, whatever instruction caused the fault. Um, but sometimes, if it's not one of these copy and write situations, our only option is to fill the process because. We can't exactly skip over this write because now we're letting a process run with just like different semantics than was implemented. Uh, we don't want them to let them write to this address where they're not allowed to. Uh, and so we just have to say, you're too bad. You don't get, you don't get to run this one. Uh, how about for our kind of non-valid uh, page table entry? Um, anyone think of uh, a, a circumstance uh, for this where we would need to, to terminate the process? Mm -hmm. Would this be like for security reasons if they're trying to access something they're not supposed to? So. If it's non, if it's a non-valid entry, then they're not supposed to be able to access it in the first place. Yeah, that that's exactly the, the right idea. That if they're accessing some virtual address that is just that they're not that is not uh, uh, ever going to be kind of that, that is not a valid thing for them in the process to, to access, uh, then yes, yeah, well, they they can't do that. We, there's no way that they can. Uh, an example would be uh, accessing address zero, which a process might do by dereferencing a null pointer. There's never going to be a page at address zero that they can use. Like the way the virtual, at least on x86, the way the virtual address space is set up is like hex 400,000 or something is the lowest address where stuff gets loaded in, and address zero just never going to, to, to work, and so always have to like in the in the program with with a, a segmentation fault something like that. Um, how about when would we be able to recover from this kind of non-valid entry? Let me try to access the tape table with not loaded. Exactly. That. Uh, and this is the entire kind of point of of Lab Four is dealing with these page faults that are access to a valid virtual address that just we haven't allocated a physical page for yet. And so the page fault handler can identify that case and at that point allocate the physical page. Why, why might we want to, why, why wouldn't we want to just have allocated the physical page before this point? Why why would we want to do it in the page fault handler? Right. They might not need that, so why do they need it? Exactly. We, uh, we could ahead of time assume that the process is going to use kind of all pages that they could, which might be a lot if we allow a process to have, I don't know, up to a gigabyte of space on the heap. We could preemptively allocate a gigabyte of physical memory for their heap. But Almost all processes are not going to use that much memory, and so we will delay allocating the actual physical memory until such time as the process actually accesses uh, an address that we need. Questions on that? All right, so I want to go through a kind of more complete uh, example of this to just kind of get us all on the same page of everything that's, that's, that's going on. Uh, but before I do that, 
Uh, I have one, uh, Grover Cleveland, to talk to you about um, our 22nd, uh, the, the 22nd president of the United States. Um, uh, total aside, but this uh, image, ridiculously high resolution. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we really, really get a good look at, at Grover here. Um, so, uh, not a not a particularly memorable president. Maybe you you've never never heard of him. Uh, he was a a, a Democrat, uh, something of a, a reformer, fighting corruption and and uh, so on. Um, over kind of pushed for uh, uh, something called the Dawes Act, which was a, a change in the federal government's policy on on Native Americans, uh, with the idea that. Uh, uh, if the government were to break up Native American land and erase Native American culture, like everything would be good. Uh, in retrospect, this was uh, is not viewed as, as a good idea or, or a just thing. Uh, and but this kind of this effort that started at this point lasted for for many decades before policy was changed. Uh, but the the main thing about uh, Grover Cleveland that I find memorable is the campaign where he was elected. So there was a uh, scandal uh, where he supposedly had a child out of wedlock with some woman in, in Buffalo, New York, and uh, he would be heckled at campaign events with calls of like, uh, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Um, uh, and he, he was supposed to be this upstanding guy, but it was this, this sort of past. But uh, his opponent, uh, James G. Blaine, had been mired in so many scandals throughout the, he had been in politics uh, for a while. Here's a political cartoon where uh, James G. Blaine has, is like covered with tattoos of all the different scandals uh, that he had been involved in. Uh, so really, uh, maybe not anyone comes out looking very good uh, from this campaign. And Cleveland uh, was not successful in, in winning re-election. Uh, after his term, so we, we have another another one term one term president. All right. Kind of sketch out a more a more complete picture of this. Uh, let's say we have a. A 64 byte virtual address space, very small, but keep it small so that you can kind of keep everything uh, in mind. And we'll have a 16 byte page size so that our virtual address space consists of just four pages. Four 16 byte pages in our 64 bytes of virtual memory. And uh, We can uh, give these uh, virtual pages, uh, uh, virtual page numbers. Since we have four of them, we will have 00, zero, zero 01, one, 10, zero, and 11. One, one. Uh, and so if, if we need to, to number four different pages, we can use two bits to give us those four different numbers. Uh, and maybe one of these will be the page for code, the page for heap, a virtual page that is currently not being used by this process, and a page for the stack. And uh, if we look at, say, The addresses, the, all the different virtual addresses that would be inside uh, this first this first virtual page. Uh, let's say, all right, virtual page uh, zero. And then we have uh, uh, the the kind of the first the first byte in this virtual page address zero. Uh, why would the address be six bits? 
This is a 64-byte virtual address. Two to the six, please. Exactly. That we need to give an address to each of our 64 bytes, and we need six bits to, 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 to do that. Uh, and kind of after our first byte, we have the second byte, and the third byte, and the fourth byte, and so on, all the way up to the 15th. Byte. Uh, byte 0 through 15, 16 bytes of our, our virtual page. And this is just to emphasize that our, if we write out all the addresses, we see that our virtual page number of 0, 0 is the highest order bits of every address within that virtual page. So if we now look at the page table, Uh, and put in this page table uh, a valid bit, a physical page number, and our access. Remember, we're using our virtual page numbers as the index into our uh, page table. So as the first entry in, in the table, first entry in the array. Uh, it would be valid. The code is actually in memory. It has a corresponding physical page. Uh, and if we say in this example, we'll do 128 bytes of physical memory. Uh, and so for to identify a physical page, there'll be eight 16-byte pages in our 128 byte physical memory. So we'll need three bits to say, okay, this virtual page 00, zero corresponds to physical page 001. Zero zero and it's code, so it's read only. Next is our heap. We'll say that's mapped to uh, uh, physical page uh, 100 zero zero or 4. And we can both read and write the heap. Our third entry here would have a valid bit of zero. Why is that? That's not being used right now. Exactly. Our process isn't using it, so we have not allocated a physical page for it, and so there's no translation from an address in this virtual page to a physical page. There's no such physical page has been allocated. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, these, I'm just saying, this is where these pages have been uh, allocated in physical memory according to whatever allocation scheme the kernel is using. But yeah, there, these, these choices are, are arbitrary for the sake of this example. Uh, so there will be something in the physical page number and access for this non valid page because. There are bytes in memory to store this, but uh, when this value bit is zero, we can't ever read what is there because we have to, it's, it's dangerous garbage. Uh, and finally, our stack is valid. We'll say that's been mapped to the last physical page, and that's read -write. And if we had an instruction like move 17, the something that address 17 to RDX. We kind of perform this translation by splitting up 17 uh, into our EPN and, and offset. Uh, what is 17 in, in binary? We wrote it down in, in six bits. Zero. Zero. One. Oh, yes. yeah, 116 and 11 one in our six bits. So we take our VPN, use that as an index into our page table. Say, so, okay, it's valid. This is a read. That's allowed. 
take our physical page number, concatenate it with our offset, and we get the address of where in the 128 bytes of physical memory uh, we need to go retrieve uh, our, our 8 bytes to, to store in our ES. This translation step makes sense? Any questions on this? All right, so we've gotten that one uh, uh, important benefit of this kind of paging scheme already, uh, and which I've said that Lab 4 is all about. Uh, which is the idea of demand paging, which is page table entries for some pages that a program might need. We can start those as invalid and then and then when the process attempts to access something in that page, we're going to end up in the page fault handler. And at that point the page fault handler can allocate an actual physical page for that. Uh, and one nice use of this is we can start a program running before all its data and code have been loaded into memory. All we have to do is load the first page of code into memory and then set up page table entries for the other pages that the program might need. And then only at the point where the program actually tries to execute some part of code that is not loaded into memory would we actually allocate a page for it and load it in? So imagine a big program, maybe has lots of special case code that's only executed sometimes or rarely, and that most of the time that we run the program, we never even have to read that code in off the disk because we ne the CPU never tries to fetch uh, something from that page. So we talked about kind of the, the high-level uh, benefits of this fixed-size paging. We don't have external fragmentation. We can easily find free memory. We do risk some internal fragmentation. Uh, what might we do to reduce internal fragmentation? Reduce page size. Exactly. We make the pages smaller. We have less potential wasted space in each page. Uh, but this uh, brings me to kind of the first of our two problems with this paging approach, as I've described it here. Um, We, in this setup, need a page table entry for every virtual page in our virtual address space. Because for every virtual page in our address space, we need to be able to index into our page table to determine is this page valid or has uh, uh, has it been uh, is this page valid or has it been uh, or and, and is there like a physical page that we can we can do the address <coughs> translation and so to put uh, to put some some numbers to this uh, if we have a 32-bit um, address space 
and four kilobyte pages, we need something like a million page table entries. Because we can fit a million four kilobyte pages in our uh, in our virtual address space. And uh, our even though a page table entry might just be a few bytes, like three or four, um, that means we have kind of megabytes of overhead just to store the page table. Uh, our let's say our our um, our process is, is using eight megabytes of, of memory. Well, that's a fifty percent memory overhead because we have four megabytes of page table for every single process. Typical system might have hundreds of processes. We're talking about hundreds of megabytes of space just to keep these page tables around. And in most cases, the vast majority of these entries will just say there is no physical page. Because if every one of our pages were used, that would be four gigabytes of memory the process was using. That would be pretty rare. So our page tables are just way too big. They take up a lot of memory. That's a problem. The other problem is that we have some serious overhead in terms of performance. Because now, to do our virtual address translation, we first have to go to a different spot in memory where the page table is to do the address translation. And then once we have that address, we do another memory access to get the actual data we're looking for. So every time we access memory, we actually have to do two memory accesses to look up in the page table. Uh, Memory is slow on the scale of CPU instructions, and so this is a really unacceptable overhead. And so we're going to need some way to, to speed up this, this process and cut down on all these memory accesses. Sebastian. Since every memory access goes to the page table, wouldn't the page table always be in the cache, or these parts of it be? That's, uh, yes, that's exactly uh, how we're going to approach this problem is what can we cache in such a way to cut down on these memory accesses? Um, and as we'll see, in order to have, uh, in order to like, have a cache that is optimized for this kind of data and have it not be fighting with other data we want to bring in the cache, we'll actually maintain a dedicated cache for uh, page table entries. All right. Other questions so far? So I want to spend the rest of the, the time today talking about this first problem. How do we make our tables smaller? So uh, one. One thing we might think of is, well, we've talked about these two different approaches, pages and segments. Is there some way we could combine these ideas to help address our page table size problem? And so uh, I'd like you to keep in mind our uh, uh, keep in mind that we, we bring these together. We have the idea of a segment table and a page table. And I'd like you to take a few minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors how we could uh, kind of bring these together. What structure or mechanism could we use to combine these ideas in a way that would help with our page table size problem? 
All right. Uh, yeah. Cool. I'd love to hear hear your thoughts on kind of any uh, idea or partial idea about how you want to bring these two together. On. Just like use a second table for the page table, and then basically you have it. So for each, like, let's say you have a page table with like two hundred fifty entries, you split that up into like maybe two to ten segments. And there's some number of segments, and then for each of those segments, you have like a base and a bound, and the base is where it's stored, and the bound is like how high you can go without it being not zero. And if it's, if it's like it's like you have a whole section of just zero, you just put the base and the bound to be the same thing. So if you try to access it, you can see easily that like the base and bound are the same. So the page table is not valid. So you're suggesting that we have we take our page table and we have a kind of a segment for each. And one segment would correspond to some chunk of the page yes. table, and another segment would correspond to another chunk. And then, like, use the base and bound to say where it's not zero. Because if the zero, if they're the page table, there should be a bunch of ones from the code in deep, and then a bunch of zeros in the stack, a bunch of ones. So all the zeros should be together. Uh, and so, in this approach, how would we be reducing the, the number of our page table entries? Like, when the second table only has like a zero, you don't actually have an entry in the page table. I see. So if we have okay, this range of page table entries, we're not using them, then we're going to actually kind of not have that part of the page table at all. Is that what you're yeah. suggesting? Yeah, so this is uh, essentially a strategy called multi-level page tables where and the reading uh, would call this uh, this would be called the page directory and it has one entry for say every a thousand page table entries and then this page table is actually multiple page tables or kind of each of these segments, each of these ranges of a thousand pages are their own page table. And that way, if we have a range of a thousand pages that aren't used, we just don't need that page table. Um, yeah, and if, if there is time, um, I, can, I can go through this, but in the uh, numbers I was talking about, if we had a four megabyte uh, or I'd say a three megabyte overhead for our kind of single level page tables. Uh, a strategy of this might, uh, for that same process, so we had eight megabytes of virtual memory used, we had to have three or four megabytes uh, used for uh, overhead. This kind of two level strategy would get us down to like 15 kilobytes of, of overhead. So almost a factor of a thousand um, in this kind of particular example, uh, this, this would save us. Um, so yeah, this, this multi-level page table, uh, also what OSV uses. Uh, I think it has, I don't remember if it's three or four. I have 64-bit x86 is four levels, 32-bit is two levels, so OSV probably has four levels. Uh, other ideas that came up, this is not the, the only way we could combine pages and segments. No? I mean, if you channel all your, all your requests to the page table first to the seg table, and just if it references something that doesn't exist, like the page table might just be a tiny sliver in the uh, that the second table has you know allocated away. And if the if you request something that doesn't exist yet, the seg table will be like, oh, we need to increase the bounds, and it will just increase the bounds of of that segment. Yeah. So you're suggesting we we have our segments like stack and heap and whatnot, yeah. and we're ha we have a separate page table for each of those. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a, another nice way to combine these ideas because if we think about our segments, even all together, these separate segments cover only a small portion of the total virtual address space, at least in most cases. And so if we restrict our page tables to just those ranges of addresses that are in our segments, we have many fewer 
We don't need an entry for every possible virtual page, just those that match some currently existing segment. Um, and yeah, so this, this would be a, a, another way to combine these ideas to, to reduce page table size. Other thoughts or, or questions on this? Fine. Yeah, so I have a uh, meme prepared for exactly this point. That this multi-level page table has only made the situation worse. That if we have to go through kind of now multiple levels of page table, now we're not just two memory accesses per lookup, it's now three or four or five. Uh, memory accesses, uh, and so yes, memory overhead is, is intensifying. Uh, so we have made page tables smaller, but we've only made this uh, performance overhead problem much, much worse. Uh, so we're going to need some way to deal with that. Um, and we're, uh, we'll talk about how to deal with that, as I said, using, using caches um, uh, next time. But in the last few minutes, I wanted to give a bit of guidance on um, Lab 4, talk about some, some parts of OSV that will be relevant. So here, uh, make it bigger. OK, so we're just dealing with processes, process structs. Uh, now we're dealing with memory and pages. And so we need some way to get information about a process's virtual memory. That is the address space each process has inside it, this address space struct that keeps track of information about its virtual address space. And we can look at what is in the address space. Uh, most important thing is the page table, which OSV calls a VP map, a virtual page map. Um, and uh, the, all the infrastructure for doing this like multi-page table lookup uh, and address translation, that is all completely implemented already in OSV. If it weren't, memory just wouldn't work. So it has to be. Uh, and so the only, I think, interaction that you will have with the page table is adding a new entry when you allocate a new page. Uh, and there's a VP map underscore map function. Uh, that is used to add a new page table entry. Um, we also have a list of regions. And in OSV, a region, which is this struct mem region, is kind of OSV's version of segments. Now, as I said, OSV uses these multi level page tables. The segments are not part of address translation. So the address translation is done exclusively through these. VP maps, these page tables. The purpose of these memory regions is to be able to determine what addresses fall within a valid range for that process. Because our, our memory regions are analogous to segments in that they have a virtual address where they start and a virtual address where they end. So given a memory region and a virtual address, we can say, is this address inside or outside of this memory region? So even though that's not used as part of address translation, it will be useful for the uh, for the, the page fault handler. We'll need to use this information. Uh, and then for uh, uh, for convenience, uh, address spaces keep a pointer specifically to the heap memory region. There's also a list of of regions. Um, and uh, there is uh, a, a function that's, that's mentioned in the notes uh, that you can give it an address and an address space that will return which memory region, if any, that address is inside of. Uh, but as you implement uh, on-demand paging for the heap, having this pointer to the heap uh, is, is useful. Uh, you're also implementing on-demand paging for the stack. So you could conceivably uh, add a separate pointer to the stack, uh, implement that being initialized uh, appropriately, um, 
an alternative uh, and something that's unique about the stack is that the stack is always starts at a specific address. So the stack always starts at this U stack upper bound. And then it has a it, it should have a fixed number of pages. The current OSC implementation does not actually use this U stack pages. You should when you are adjusting uh, the stack setup function to make the stack memory region have the correct number of, of pages in it. Uh, but you can, instead of relying on the memory region, you can rely on, okay, the stack is always in this fixed range of addresses, and so uh, you don't necessarily have to have some way of identifying specifically which memory region is the stack. Yeah. What's, the, what's the point of the list of regions in the in memory point of this case? Uh, so, the main way that that is used, you've actually used it a lot in previous labs. Every time you call the validate pointer function in a system call, it has said, okay, given this address space and this virtual address, search through the list of memory regions in that address space and return to me uh, which region this address is in, or null if it's not in any region. So, this list of regions is like the process needs to kind of know which segments of memory, which regions of virtual memory it's kind of currently using. And this is important for if the user gives you an address to check is this address in one of these regions or is it not. Um, and yeah, so uh, setting up the stack region appropriately in lab four is important to make sure that this validate pointer works. If someone gives you an address on the stack, this validate pointer will correctly tell you is it within the 10 pages of the stack or, or not. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I have my hours tomorrow night, and I will see you on Friday. So, uh, I'm bound myself. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.